Hello everybody, so I'm going to make a slight change from the statewide course shell here. Um, something that's become a problem in previous semesters. Um, if I go to modules, uh, I'll see it here. Um, da, 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 da. Here we go, module 5. So um, currently you will see something different. This one will be gone by then, but there's this. Uh, uses a written tutorial. They have you type a whole bunch of YAML code and all sorts of stuff to get a CI/CD pipeline going um, and combine it into Docker. And it's very cluttered. And um, people have had trouble following that the last couple times I taught the class. There was a lot of questions. But um, the reason I'm fully replacing it now is it uses GitLab instead of GitHub. And in starting this past spring, GitLab started requiring users to enter a credit card in order to do that. And I am definitely not going to ask you to enter a credit card, uh, enter your credit card information to do the homework. So I'm replacing that with the ones that I use on in a uh, classroom, which in the classroom at Sellersburg, I split it up into two different ones. Um, you still only have one assignment. So my restrictions uh, for changing things from the statewide course shells is I can't change the point value. So in the classroom in Sellersburg, I usually do two different assignments. Um, uh, this will be edited right now. It has Java and Python, but obviously I copied it over here once and forgot to remove the Java part. So if I forget again and there's still a Java part in there, um, scroll down to Python part. This is the part, obviously that's the part we need for this class. So um, here's the instructions to do a Docker file. And then right afterwards, uh, there'll be a second one that's going to be replacing the module five lab from the statewide shell, which handles the, um, CI CD pipeline on GitHub, which, well, for one is a lot easier. Um, for two, it's free. They will not ask you to enter credit card information in order to submit a homework assignment. That's the, that was the breaking point of the reason the other, like I was able to answer questions about the, um, original assignment, but I'm not going to ask you to enter credit card information. So it just follows through here. Um, the GitHub one's easier too. I like this one because I chose a particular one that instead of adding a little bit of code to the YAML file, we just delete a section of code from the YAML file. Makes it really, really easy. And then it's one click to get your package pushed out. Um, so what is a CI CD pipeline? So continuous integration, continuous deployment is the, um, uh, the modern way of releasing software without the traditional version numbers, right? So like we're in Python, so this fall we're using what, like 3.11.7 version three, release 11, patch number seven on it. Uh, and those get pushed out and then we have to rely on our end users to update it and stuff. Well, continuous integration, continuous deployment is a different type of release where every time they open the app, they just download the latest version from the repository. So um, they are always downloading the latest version and we don't have to worry about updates and stuff. We just have to worry about making sure our main branch is, um, is bug free because that's what users are actually going to open every time. So um, I'm replacing the original assignment with the ones I have from class. So if you have any questions, please reach out to me immediately because I wrote these assignments. So, uh, I can probably answer quicker than a Google search on those. And, but I thought this is going to be a short video just talking about replacing those. So why don't we go ahead and work through the process while we're at it? So let's, um, jump back to the desktop and do some, uh, actually build this real quick. Thanks. And I suppose if you want to, you can just, um, since we're going to walk through it in a video, you could probably avoid reading those instructions altogether if you want to and just follow the video because we'll do it all right here. So first thing we need is a Python application to do this. A simple application will work, just a hello world will be sufficient. So I'm going to come over to uh, um, create a new folder to keep everything organized. Come over to my working directory and I'll just call this greetings. I'm just going to do a hello world. Um, nothing too fancy. Uh, but 
there is a requirement in the assignment that you do put something in the manifest that has to be installed. So something that's not in the default installation of Python. So that means we need the requirements.txt file. Uh, so I'll open this with my text editor. Um, I need to create a couple files. So I'll have Sublime, create um, read.py, the actual application, and then that uh, the requirements.txt, because, uh, yeah, that's one of the assignment requirements is that you put something in the manifest. All right, so now we're ready to do this. I'm just going to do a simple hello world with um, emojis. That way Docker does have to install something. Uh, so import emoji, and oh, then set up a function here, say hi, that will just return the string. Um, oh, emoji dot uh, I think it's waving hand and then uh, globe showing Americas. Oh, it does have a capital A in it, I believe. Um, I think that's the name of the emoji. If that's not the name of the emoji, I'm going to have to pause the video and go look up what the name of the emoji is. But just a hello world. Um, let's see. If the name of this file is, well, if the Python interpreter renames that as main instead of whatever we called it, then that means that's the one we hit the run button on. Typical guard statement. Uh, and if that's the case, then go ahead and print whatever the result of that say hi function is. So let's uh, save this and see if I did that correctly. Um, I do have to go back to uh, my other thing. I'm not in VS Code. I'm using Sublime, where we get an option of how we install our terminal. And the one I use has a lot of features, but it doesn't show emojis. So I use Terminix, and Terminix doesn't show emojis. So I have to come back over here and run regular PowerShell to see if those emojis work. Um, yeah, so there's our thing. We'll have Python run greet.py. And there we go. There's the hello world with emojis. So uh, our application works. So now we just need to fill in the requirements.txt. Um, I guess I'll use, I can use PowerShell to see what it is. Uh, this is what the virtual environments do. They just make this line easier. If we do pip freeze, this is the only thing we get from virtual environments. It shows us everything that's not part of the default installation of Python, which can be kind of long, but I do factory resets on my computers every couple months, so the list never gets too long. Just depends on the projects. There we go. So I need this emoji library. Um, it's the only thing I need in the manifest. Um, the Python application works. So now we are ready to turn this application into a Docker application, and then we'll set it as our CI CD pipeline. But since this is a classroom setting, I'm going to draw a picture here first uh, and explain what we're doing. Just go over those processes, make sure it makes sense. So we have our application, but as you all are probably well aware, when we finish an application, we usually don't give end users source code and then have them run that from the terminal. We need a way to get it on their computer. So um, somewhere over here, uh, this will be the user's, the end user's computer. And then we have our application. I'll just draw it like a file. It's probably a bunch of files, but I'll just draw one file. So the traditional way is we would create an installer and then use that installer to put some version on there, right? Like 3.4.5, uh, version 3, release 4, patch number 5, and that goes on there. But then we have to worry about our the users uh, being able to access that file. Right? That uh, They can come in there and see a file that they don't know the name of and decide it should be deleted, and then the whole program is going to crash. Or um, they could go in there and change the configuration files and once we give it to them, we don't have control anymore. So uh, containers give us a way to take it that a step further. And instead of just installing that software, what we do is we make a small, lightweight virtual machine 
because if we as the software developers are making this virtual machine, then that means we have complete control over it. We have, um, we have, uh, we set up all the configurations and stuff, and then the user is not going to know how to get into a, uh, a a virtual machine in binary format in order to delete configuration files or uh, resources that our app depends on and lead to crashing and stuff. So that's what a container is. It's a lightweight virtual machine that we as software developers take full control of, and then that's what we install on the user's machine. And a CI CD pipeline takes this a step further by uh, instead of instead of installing that we put that on our repository so there's some URL that points to that virtual machine on our repository and then what we give the end user is basically just that URL so then the you the end user we never have to worry about them not running updates or anything. If there's an update to our software, we make it on the repository. And every time the end user opens that opens that app, they're actually pulling a new one from the URL to the repository. On their end, it looks the same because we give them a little icon to double click on. And the difference is what happens in the background. And that's what a CI CD pipeline is. So we containerize our application, which is, um, a much better way of releasing applications to end users. And then for the CI CD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous deployment, we actually just give the end user the URL of where they will go get our, get the application. But on their end, it looks the same because they just double click on an icon and it opens. So that's kind of what we're doing here. So we need to set up this lightweight virtual machine, the Docker machine. So, uh, well, there's multiple containers. We're going to use Docker here. Docker makes a great introduction to them. So the first thing we will, we will need something to, uh, you will need to install Docker, which you can install to run totally in the background. But for the purposes of our class, it's a lot easier if we um, just use Docker desktop, just search for Docker desktop, or actually I'll put a link in the instructions. Just download and install this on whatever machine you're on whatever the appropriate chip for a Mac is, a Linux machine or the Windows machine. And this is the easiest way to run Docker. So that's nice in our um, classroom where we're under tight time constraints. And then once that's on your machine, you'll just need to start it. So Docker desktop. And it should just take a second here to start up. Which we don't really need to see this part. Uh, you look through it. Uh, we might come back and look at stuff. I'm just going to I hit the close, but if I come down to the little tray here, you'll notice that it is running still. There's uh, Docker desktop is running. So in order to turn our application into a virtual machine for Docker to run, uh, in particular, it's a virtual Linux machine. There are some really good reasons why software developers kind of prefer to develop on Linux machines and run their software on Linux machines. I'm not going to get into that right now, but there are good reasons for it. So Docker runs uh, virtual Linux machines, uh, Linux VMs on the user's computer as a small lightweight container that we control. So we need to create that. And that is really easy. Uh, we just create this file called Docker file. So I'll have sublime create Docker file. And it is um, like requirements.txt. It's stuff that's going to happen in the background automatically. Um, if you haven't seen that before, let me open PowerShell real quick. Whenever we run pip install something, right? Uh, whatever module we, we want to install in the background, pip turns around and runs pip install. Well, I better go to the folder we're in document slash delete slash greeting greetings there it is and uh, whenever we install something pip turns around in the background runs pip install dash r requirements dot txt which goes through the manifest and just looks it's obviously it's already satisfied knew that was on my computer but it's not on a blank docker machine so 
that's why that part's included here. So we create this um, Docker file that will spin up a virtual machine. And just like requirements.txt, that is a command that's going to be called in the background without any exception handling. So it needs to be spelled exactly like that. Capital D, no spaces, no extension. And yeah, I'll just go ahead and create it. The reason I create it down here is so that it already has a name and stuff. And all I have to do is hit save when I'm done. I don't have to worry about those other parts. So the first line is what is our starting image? So we want to start at something. So I'm going to do Python colon three. So um, start a virtual machine that has Python three installed. And there are lots and lots and lots of starting points. We could probably find a starting point that has Python 3 installed with only the emoji library installed for ours, but I wanted you to run from the manifest here for a reason. Um, so just from Python 3, and now we need to, that will set up our virtual machine. And it's a virtual Linux machine, so we need to set our working directory on that virtual Linux machine. It's a Linux machine, so make sure your directory name starts with a slash the Linux root directory, and then whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, probably not app. I'll just call it greetings slash app. We'll put it there. Gives us a working a place to work at. And now we need to copy our files from the Windows machine where we're, run, where we're building that Docker image over to the virtual machine. So we'll say copy, and we want to copy greet.py dot for current directory and the first one refers to the machine you're running this on so that's in my case the windows machine and the second one is where you put the linux virtual machine so the dot here refers to this working directory um, probably want the other file to copy requirements dot txt over to that linux virtual machine oh to the linux virtual machine and then we need to run that so that we can uh, install that emoji library that our application depends on. So run pip install dash r requirements dot txt. And then we run our command to actually start our application. Which this one is the syntax sum. Um, it's not my favorite syntax to use, but the command we want to run, and then we pass in an array and pass in each word of the those instructions as an element in a list or an array. Or it it's a list. Uh, I shouldn't say array, but um, whatever you want to call it. The square, we set up square brackets, so we have a bunch of word, a collection of words going in, and then we pass them in one at a time. Uh, greet.py instead of just python space greet.py that's the string we want to run but we have to pass them in separately as elements in the list and then docker will figure out what to do with them so that's all we need for the docker file and this is enough to create a virtual machine that runs our application um, so we can do that in the terminal here um, so here i'm going to say i want to have docker and I'm going to have Docker build something, the current directory. So I'm in this directory. So Docker build what's in the current directory. Dash T stands for a repository name. I have no idea who chose that parameter, but it does actually stand for a repository name. And then we have to give it a name. So I'm going to call it greet. And... Docker's going to do its thing. We don't necessarily need to sit here and watch meters run, so I'm going to pause the video while that, that happens. Okay, it didn't take too long. Um, if I scroll up a little, there was a time there. Yeah, so it took 34 seconds. There's no need to have the video running during that 34 seconds, but it built that application. So now if I say Docker images-a, this will get a list of them. So notice in the repository name, we now have this one called greet, uh, made 27 seconds ago. And you can run it from that name now. So I can say docker run 
dash ti is the interactive terminal, which I'm in Terminix here, so it's not going to show the emojis. We'll see the little um, can't show emoji symbol. I'll go over to the other one here in a second and do that, or PowerShell and do it here in a second. And we can use the name, which, yeah, um, Terminix doesn't load those. Let me go over to PowerShell and do that. In this directory, do those same things. Uh, list out all the images. And it, but instead of using the name, this will be important for the next step in the CI CD pipeline. We can also use the ID. So I'm going to copy that ID and say docker run dash ti for interactive terminal and then that ID and there's the results of our application. So that gets us up to a docker file. Um, I deleted that picture, didn't I? So now we need to get these onto a uh, onto a an online repository where we can run a CI CD pipeline from that. And GitHub makes that super easy. So we're done in the text editor here. Um, let's jump over to GitHub and build our CI CD pipeline. Since there's only three files, I'm just going to bring them over the easy way. Uh, so if I go and just upload instead of doing it from a terminal, I'll create a new repository. Um, I'll call it Python greeting. Uh, description, uh, an example of GitHub workflows to make a CI CD pipeline for a Dockerized application. That work, make it public, add a README and a license. Sure, Apache license looks good. We'll create the repository. By this point in the semester, hopefully nothing too fancy there. And since there's only three files, I'm just going to upload them this way, the easy way. Bring in our files and commit the changes. Probably could have put a commit message or something useful there. So now that that's working, we need to create the CI CD pipeline. And what I want to do is uh, have it push out to the packages here. There's a nice easy one I found. So if we come over to the actions tab on GitHub, there's a lot of actions. It's going to look at things and, well, um, GitHub is looking at what I've been doing lately. I've been doing a lot of things in Electron lately. So uh, I'm going to search for Docker container. If we search for that, um, there's one that pushes out an image, Docker image, if you see that. We have to add code at the end of it. If you look for publish Docker container, we um, delete code. So that one's a little bit easier to work with. So I'll just hit configure. And it creates a YAML file for us. YAML stands for uh, YAML ain't markup language. Personally, I don't like the recursive names, but um, YAML ain't markup language. It looks like key value pairs. so easy to type like JSON. We don't have the tags everywhere like a markup language, but in the background, it is a binary tree. It is a binary search tree like markup language. So we get the front end typing advantages of JSON, but the back end advantages of markup uh, with the YAML. So uh, what's going on here? Schedule Chrome is the scheduling thing, scheduling app in Linux. So this is saying, uh, what is 19? That's uh, seven o'clock. At seven something every day, it's going to push out a new version. It's also going to push a new version every time we make a change to the main branch. Uh, we can do it to the pull request. Oh, it is here. So anytime we push to the main branch or pull from the, make a pull request on the main branch, it's going to put, push out a new version of our, of our application. It's going to seem the next version's ready. So it goes, so we'd work on like a side branch and then pull request over to the main when we get all the chain, all the bugs worked out. Um, environment is, it's going to spin up some machines uh, where we're running on. It's Docker, read through there. Um, it's going to spin up a, what's called a runner. So that's just a temporary server that it's going to use to build this. 
Um, then all the steps it's going to take, a bunch of stuff. One of them here, the, on this one, it installs uh, a secure thing. It installs a signature, right? The whole um, verification of who wrote the program and everything. And right now, the only uh, the only encryption key it has to use for the signature is the one we used to sign into GitHub, and it won't actually use that one. I'm going to leave that part just to make the let the uh, homework easy. But if we scroll down to the bottom, so here's after the image is built, and here's where it signs it. So in the default template, line 84, uh, I'll pause for a second so you can see what's there. This is the part where it actually signs it. Just delete that. And for your homework, it'll be fine if you don't have a digital sig signature on there. Um, so just scroll down there and delete that last little section in the template. It was from line 84 on. If I undo this part at the bottom, you look over that, scroll all the way to the bottom. See, I'm at the bottom of the file. Just delete that part, and when you're ready, you can commit changes, or it's on GitHub, so if you hit Control S, that will automatically commit the changes. Sure, those look good. It'll make the commit. We won't see anything, but if we go back to the Actions tab, it is building that application. It shouldn't take too long to build our pipeline. It's Friday night at 8 o'clock when I'm making this video. Okay, I was going to say, there's no way the GitHub things are, oh wait. It's Friday in the Eastern time zone. So actually, yeah, GitHub probably is really, really busy at 7.53 Eastern time on a Friday night. But once that's going, um, it's going to run through all the instructions in that YAML code. You can come over here and watch it as you want. Uh, building this it might take a moment. I'm going to pause the video while it builds. OK, that one did take a while. Well, uh, one minute and 14 seconds. I guess that's not a long time, but as far as um, why I paused the video, we didn't need to sit here and watch that for a minute. Um, then uh, if we go back up to the Actions tab, you'll see a green check mark there that it successfully built, or a red X if something went wrong. And if, it, if you get the red X, you just click on it, and it'll show you what the error message is. Now if we go back to the main page for this repository, down under Packages, here's where it pushed out our pipeline. And it gives us this URL. So I'm going to copy this URL, and um, I'm going to open Docker Desktop real quick. So I'm going to delete all these previous containers, which, yeah. Uh, the image is how we build a container, and the container is the virtual machine. So if you try to delete the images, it'll, it'll tell you that one of the containers is using those. So I'm going to delete those. I'll come over here to the images, then delete the images that build those containers. So you can see now I don't have anything going on Docker. There's no images to build virtual machines with, and there's no virtual machines running. I'll close that, but again, Docker Desktop keeps running in the background. It just uh, got rid of the GUI. So now I'll copy that and go back to PowerShell, or whatever terminal you hit, you're in. Docker is cross-platform. I can just do it right here. Uh, so Docker, um, actually, I'm just going to paste that. Docker, pull all of that. So I just run that instruction that copied and pasted. It grabbed it. Mine went really quick because it did scan through and notice that that image I just deleted, it was cached, so it used the cache one. But um, we can see downloaded newer image for that. Uh, so. This just downloads the latest version from the main branch of our repository. And now if we do those other parts, uh, docker images-a to list them out. So probably don't want to type that in every time. So I'm going to copy the ID and then say docker run-di and paste in that ID. Whoops. Only paste that ID once. Paste it in once. And then when we hit enter, it should run our application. So that's the modern way of deploying so software. Um, we would still give the user, end user, an installer. And what the installer does is it runs this line. It just, um, we give the installer, instead of installing our application, we install a small script that runs this line. So it always pulls the latest version or checks to see if there's a newer version. If 
if there's no change, if there hasn't been any changes, it uses the one that's on there. So you don't have to be online to do it. It will remember what it does. If you're online, it will pull the latest version. If you're not online, it will just use the image as. And then listing these out, you'll notice that's a table. So that's a two dimensional array. So um, row zero is our headers, row one, element two, zero one two is our ID. So we would just give a script that runs this line and then this line and pulls that gives back an array and we take element zero two from that array and then that's the one we want to run. That's the modern way of deploying software development. So that's what those instructions are. Let me look at them one more time. Uh, I was hoping to keep this under 30 minutes, but it went over. Um, well, once this course is published at the start of the semester, you'll see it at the beginning. These will be in module five, but I haven't copied them over yet. So um, here's the two I use in a classroom to replace what's in the statewide course shell that asks for a terminal. The section about Java will be deleted and you'll just see the one about Python. So there's all the instructions to create the Python file. And along with that, I copied over a second uh, set of instructions to um, go through and do that, uh, publish a Docker container to the packages on GitHub. All the stuff in the video, so you can refer to the lines there if you wanna copy them uh, or copy and paste them. I shouldn't say that. If, if, you, if you need a reference to them, they are in those instructions. Uh, that's how, how I do it in the classroom is two separate instructions, but when I change instructions in the statewide course shells, I'm not allowed to change point values, so there will only be one submission there. But that is what uh, the assignment is, the, and that's the modern way that we release software. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will see you soon.